wait, wait. Come here, come here, come here. So what am I thinking out there? You hit them high, hit them hard, and hit them fast. Stay out of the crowd, just deliver the mail. And remember, honey, these people don't matter. Now get out there and warm them up for me, babe. How you doing? Good? All right. All right. All right, all right, all right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm not a good one, but uh, these are the same pants I wore in high school. Just eight inches lower now. I'm married, I guess you guys know that, right? Yeah, it's great. Great being married, because you got that commitment. When you're just dating, you're so insecure, and for good reason, too. My last relationship, I was always there for her, and she dumped me, and I told her about it, too. I said, remember when you lost your job? I was there. Remember when you flunked out of school? I was there. Remember when your grandma died? I was there. She's like, I know, you're bad luck. And uh, <laughs> it was a horrible relationship, but it ended, it ended kind of nice. We talked in the end. It was just me and her and the police. And we talked. And... <laughs> Folks, I'm not a sexist, but I'm pretty good. You know, anyway. I'm... You know, any single guys here? I'll tell you, it's a tough life. Yeah, it's a t tough life for you guys, ain't it? Pretty, it's pretty lonely. It's pretty sad. People don't realize it. Every night it was the same thing for me. I'd go home and curl up in bed with my favorite book. Well, actually, it was a magazine. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm married. I had to get married, folks. I had to get married because I'm fat and I started going bald. So I had to get married. I had to make my move. It's true. Fat guys can get married and bald guys can get married. But fat, bald guys, <laughs> forget it. The chicks don't dig them. So. Now I'm married, it's okay to be fat and bald, and as a matter of fact, I don't have to bathe anymore. So it's great. <laughs> Rosie's three kids live with us, and it's great. Uh, of course, at first the kids didn't know what to call me. Do they call me Tom? Do they call me stepdad? They call me the intruder, is what they call me. <laughs> we got married January 20th. I, I got her a great wedding gift. I wanted to get her something kind of personal, so I got her one of those fur coat kits. <laughs> See that? It's a Velcro coat with 100 gerbils, you know? <laughs> She got me some edible underwear. I don't know what the big deal is about those. You wear them for a couple days, it tastes just like the other ones. <laughs> Anybody into bondage here? I'll tell you, I really am. What I do when I'm in the mood is I'll tie her up and gag her and then I'll go in the living room and watch a football game. You know. <laughs> How many homosexuals are here tonight? <laughs> you know, I love gay guys because they're less competition and they're usually the best looking guys. Am I right, ladies? Am I right? Here's a tip for you gals. Here's how you tell if a guy's gay, it works 100% of the time. See what I look like? If a guy looks better than me, he's gay. <laughs> anyway, I'm from Iowa. My family lives back there still. My favorite person is my grandma. She's 85 years old and she's starting to lose her memory and everybody's upset about it except for me because I got eight checks for my birthday from her. And <laughs> that's 40 bucks right there, folks, so. My younger brother, Scott, he's kind of a criminal, and I blame myself because we got him in a lot of trouble when we were kids. Anything I dared him to do, he'd do. One time we were in the park, I dared him to steal this woman's purse, and he did it, and the cops caught him. They took him down to the police station, and they put him in the lineup with these other guys, and Scott's not very smart. First they face to the right, then they face to the left, then they look straight ahead, and he's like, hey, that's her, you know. <laughs> Our parents got divorced when we were kids, and it was kind of cool because we got to go to divorce court with them, and it was like a game show. My mom won a house and a car. We're all excited, you know. My dad got some luggage, yeah. <laughs> so I turned 50 last summer, and my stepmom said I should get him a gift to reflect his personality, but I figured, what the hell? I'll get him something anyway. <laughs> got him one of those hot air balloon rides with a lot of champagne, because he's afraid of heights and he gets suicidal when he drinks, and you know. <laughs> well, tell you, worst problem in the world's gotta be missing children. Am I right, folks? It's just awful, huh? Just awful. We got the wrong people looking for those kids, too. We got the FBI, they're looking for them, they can't find them. That's why I say you gotta get the Student Loan Association looking for them because, <laughs> hey, those bastards will get on the phone, I'll tell you. I graduated from the University of Iowa nine years ago. I've moved 40 or 50 times, never left any forwarding address anywhere. I'm walking through the casino here today and a pay phone rings and they found me. Thank you very much, good night everybody. Thank you, thanks. Bozan Arnold.
Oh, you're all my friends. You know, I don't mind telling you that I've spent more than one sleepless night trying to figure out what I could do that would be worth 40 bucks. But then I figured out I'd be telling roughly 400 jokes. Oh, that's what, 10 cents a joke? Oh, some jokes are longer, so they're about a quarter, some are shorter, they're about a nickel. <gasps> so it all just evens out, doesn't it? You know, I've been away for a very long time, ladies and gentlemen, approximately three years. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Roseanne, what happened? You used to play in 15,000 seat auditoriums and now you're reduced to playing little fucking banquet halls in Atlantic City. <laughs> Where the show has to be over by midnight so they can set up for the Sunday fish fry. happened, ladies and gentlemen. You happened. Yes, yes, yes. I need to feel closer to my people. I need that excitement that comes from the live stage. And, oh, I know most of you got in free because of the radio giveaway, but <laughs> I'll make a little deal with you. You give me just a little bit of you, and I'll give you all of me. Please stop that music. You see, because there's just something I must say off the top of my head and from the bottom of my heart to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. This place is very special to me. Here I am constantly reminded of the awesome balance of nature and how precious it all is. But seriously, folks, I have been in show business a long time, and you people are without a doubt the <laughs> finest audience I have ever had the privilege of performing in front of. And this place, casino name here, in the world, and Tom Arnold is hung like a horse. <laughs> it is so good to be back. You know, I could never imagine wanting to sing in public again, but then again, I could never imagine the possibility of nuclear winter. <laughs> Someone left the cake out in the rain. You know, I get so tired up here. <laughs> Little cake. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I was recently released from the Betty Ford Clinic. <laughs> oh, I didn't even want to be on drugs, but my publicist said it would help my comeback. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. Actually, at a younger age, I was injured uh, in a horseback riding accident during the making of one of my first movies, National Velvet. <laughs> and over the years, my back condition just worsened and worsened until finally I became addicted to prescription drugs. My doctor prescribed crack. You remember before I went away, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? I made one movie, which was a critical and box office flop. Yes, it was based on my life growing up as a Jewish girl in Salt Lake City, Utah. It was called Rodeo Queen. You remember, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? I'll tell you, it was really interesting to learn how to ride on those bucking broncos. Of course, when I rode them, they didn't exactly buck, they kind of like buckled. And 
there was a clown waving a piece of pizza trying to get me to come off the animal, but I felt so good because a lot of guys stay on 10, 12 seconds. I stayed on until the fucking vet came. So I was very pleased with that. Well, I haven't really been gone, really, ladies and gentlemen, over the last few years when you haven't seen me too much. I've been performing in little gay theaters, gay cabaret. Actually, I was kept alive due to the very good graces of the gay community, and I would like to thank you all tonight. I thank God for creating these gay men, because if it was not for them, us fat women would have no one to dance with. And of course we know that half the gay community are lesbians. Oh, but you knew that, didn't you, ladies and gentlemen? And because of my awakening political consciousness, there's something I must say on behalf of the lesbian. I do not believe that lesbians are treated fairly in our society today, ladies and gentlemen. Unfairly is how they're treated. People all the time say, lesbians hate men, lesbians hate men, lesbians hate men. Well, how could that be? They don't have to fuck them. <laughs> Whatever do they know about hate, right, ladies? But you know, right now I would like to perform for you some of my older jokes, you know, my classic jokes, you know, the jokes that made me the huge, huge star that I am today and once was. Jokes such as these. I never go anywhere, I'm a housewife. Of course, I hate that word. I prefer to be called domestic goddess. And you know what I do all day? Yes, you're right. I lay there on the couch eating those bonbons, watching those soap operas, and tuning into that Donahue show. Because there's a show you can really learn something from. I didn't even know it was possible to be a woman trapped in a man's body. The other day on Donahue, they had on these men that like to dress up like women, and when they do, they can no longer parallel park. Well, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I'm Jewish, so that's why I'm like this. Um, I prefer to call those people the Nazi Amish. But... That is Utah, that is where I was born and reared, more than once. But you know, kids, they're cute, but they're so rude. I'm taking a shower, my daughter comes in there, gosh, mom, I hope when I grow up, my breasts will grow nice and long like yours. <laughs> well, I'm fat, I thought I'd point that out. Fat people don't think like thin people, we have our own way of thinking, different. Did you ever go up to a fat person on the street and ask him where something is? And they tell you like this, this is when the difference really shows. Well, go down here to Arby's, go right past Wendy's, McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's that chocolate brown building over there. And husband jokes. Yes, husband jokes, ladies and gentlemen, such as, my husband says he need more space, so I locked him outside. And man jokes. Yes, the men think they do everything better than the women, don't they? But you're wrong. All you men, you are wrong. I have it all figured out. Actually, you only do three things better than we do. One, peeing out a campfire. <laughs> Two, writing your names in the snow using no utensils. <laughs> and three, reading those maps. Oh, the men, they're better at reading the maps. Way better, uh-huh, yeah. Because only the male mind could conceive of one inch equaling a hundred miles! Thank you so much. You know, there's one group of people that I also believe, because my awakening political consciousness, are not treated fairly in the United States of America by the United States government. The Vietnam vets. Are you a vet? Any vets here? Any Vietnam vets here? You, mister? Where'd you serve? Korea. <laughs> Korea. <laughs> yes, not all war injuries are physical, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Anyway, I'm glad you 
are back. I'm glad you didn't get hurt over there in Korea too badly, and I'm glad you're here paying $40 to see my show. The Vietnam vets are not treated fairly. I have a lot of empathy for them because they had to go to a horrible place and perform a grotesque job under hideous conditions for people who didn't even appreciate it. And I know just what that's like because I used to be a waitress at Denny's. <laughs> but it's tough for the men, it's tough for the men. <laughs> A lot of men these days have a lot of sexual problems. I know, I've seen it on Donahue. It's true. A lot of men are impotent, ladies and gentlemen, and it's very, very sad. How many men here are impotent? I see, can't get your arms up either. Well, you know. <laughs> well, you know. Now for the good news. They have an operation to help all of you men out. I saw it on Donahue. The penile implant operation can help you not be impotent anymore. Okay, they go underneath the skin of the male member and they surgically implant a very small system of hydraulics under there so the man can function normally in a sexual manner. Anyways, I know it's true because my lawyer, Mickey over here, Mickey, raise your hand. He can do that now. Mickey. <laughs> Mickey, he had that operation. He did. And him and his wife, Judy, oh, they were getting along so good. But then their neighbor went and put in a Stanley Automatic garage door opener. <laughs> <laughs> so it has its ups and downs. But, you know, <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, right now, allow me to introduce to you my musical conductor, Mr. Mort Lindsay, been with me 10 years. tonight, Mort. You know, I haven't seen you in a while. I don't think I've seen you since, oh, before the holidays, not even since before Christmas. I haven't even talked to you at all. Did you do anything special for Christmas? Did you go any place special? You know, Fire Island, the East Village, San Francisco. <laughs> go any place special like that, huh? Did you, huh, Mort? Oh, what do you care, you fat, tone-deaf bitch? <laughs> ah, so you went to the islands. Before we do the tropical medley. Back to the idea of Christmas. One of my very favorite Gentile holidays. We celebrated in my home, even though we weren't Jews. Can I have the lights down while I tell this story? Thank you. Once there was a little girl. She came from a very poor family. And every day on her way to school, well, she used to pass by Macy's window and she'd see this real pretty little red dress in the window there. It was only like $3.95. Had these real pretty sparkly things on the shoulder. And boy, she really, really wanted that dress, you know. She just was wanting this red dress so bad because she, she just knew that if she had that red dress, well, she'd feel better about the world. The world would be a better place. She'd have more self-esteem. Everything would be okay, okay, if she could just have that little red dress. But she knew jobs were hard to come by. But she asked her father anyway. She said, Daddy, you think you could buy me that little red dress over there, Macy's window for, you know, three, four dollars over there? He said, I'm sorry, honey, but you'll have to settle for your usual Christmas present of an orange or a potato on a stick or a big bowl of hamburger helper. But still she hoped and she prayed and, well, she had faith. And then, it came Christmas morning and she had that belief, you know, and she ran downstairs and she opened her present and, well, she didn't get that little dress. And I know this is a true story, ladies and gentlemen, because you see, that little girl was me.
Okay, I got the dress, but I was too fat and it didn't fit, but... <laughs> Merry Christmas anyway. Thank you, I feel your love. I feel your love and I bask in it, trust me. You know... Right now is the part of my show where, like all divas before me, yes, I too have a political message to share with you tonight because of my awakening political consciousness, as I mentioned before several times. This one, though, is the one that means the most. And I really don't give a damn if you agree with me or not. Because I believe something, and I'm going to say it. I don't care what you think. I just don't care. Something I believe, and I'm going to stick up for it. I no longer believe it is right or proper for us to wear fur. Because it's summer, for Christ's sake. I know I have mine in storage. But what are we to do about our world, our planet, the rainforest, our way of life, our galaxy, our universe, huh? What are we to do, ladies and gentlemen? Will it survive? Only time will tell. How about this, ladies and gentlemen? How about one minute of your life during the next week to think about the concept of world peace? And while you do that, Honey, could you help me get up here on the piano? than Tom Arnold, my second husband, my new husband, my favorite husband to date. <laughs> what a wonderful man he is, yes. Yes, he is a wonderful man. And you know what's really, really so nice is that, well, he's eight years younger than myself. Yeah, and I think you ladies know what I'm getting at here. The younger man, all right. Oh, they still come too quick and go to sleep right after. But the thing is, they can do it every goddamn night. <laughs> but right now, I'd like to bring this mood down a little, if that's possible. You know, ladies and gentlemen, during the early part of the 1970s, I had the very good fortune of living on an Indian reservation. <laughs> there I met a man who completely changed my life. That man's name was Billy Jack. Now the valley cried with anger, mount your horses, draw your swords, and they killed the mountain people, so they won their just reward. Then they went up to the mountain, on the mountain, dark and red, turned the stone, and there beneath it, peace on earth was. musical conductor been with me 25 years. You are so right, Paul. What the world does need now is love, sweet 
love. I still believe all that stuff from the 1960s. I, I really still believe it. Yes, I do. I do. Love and peace. Yes, I swear to God, it could save us still. For if we were all holding hands, no one could push the button. And if we all had a great big dick in our mouths, no one could speak ill of another. Let's start by holding hands. Thank you for coming to my show tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be right back as soon as I change my clothes and pee. Besides my wonderful lawyer, Mickey Robbins, right here, who's suing everyone I've ever known. <laughs> but anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, lawyers. Hey, I don't think it's right that lawyers go advertising on TV. Do you agree with me? Don't you think that's unethical? Because here we're supposed to have this great, this is the, like the greatest judicial system that's ever been on the earth, and now here they are on TV, like selling bits and pieces of it. I don't think that's right. Especially those personal injury, <laughs> like I give a shit. But you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's just called a setup, folks. But anyway, now, you know, like those personal injury lawyers, you know, with the questionable client testimonials, those people that come on TV. I was injured on the job and received $10,000. <laughs> I was injured at the mall and my lawyer got me $50,000. <laughs> but how do you know if that's a good lawyer? You have no idea because, first of all, they're only showing these people from, like, the neck up. What does that tell you? There may not be nothing there from the neck down, you know what I mean? I mean, maybe this guy got his nuts caught in a faulty escalator at Sears. He could be a rich man by now, you know? Of course, Sears, they just have those high-tone lawyers that would prove his nuts were dangling negligently. Anyway. So what does that tell you? And as a woman, I have to say this. I have to say this tonight because it really, really pisses me off. Sex discrimination pisses me off. I've had enough of it. I can't stand it no more. And you can't get away from it either because it's everywhere. Do any of you women, I mean, come on. <laughs> Support me up here, for Christ's sake. Huh, you can't get away from it. Sex discrimination, why, it's everywhere. It's even in mass murder. <laughs> you know, I do a lot of reading on serial killers, mostly how-to books and this type of thing, but... <laughs> The other day on Geraldo, my very favorite TV show of all time since the beginning of TV itself, Geraldo. <laughs> they had this whole show and it was on female serial killers. Did y'all see that? It was so awesome. You know, when I first heard it, I was like really, really excited. <gasps> female serial killers. All right, talk about women of the 90s. Talk about taking control of your life. I thought it was awesome. But then right after that, it goes in the hooter, you know, because I mean, Okay, this one serial killer gal, Mrs. Puente out there in California, had this boarding house, you know. She killed these seven guys and she hacked their bodies to bits and she buried them out in her garden and she stole their social security checks and all this type of shit, you know. And of course, I'd like to go out on a limb here and say, I am not for that. But, well, you can sort of 
understand it, though. I mean, she's on a limited income and everything. But uh, the thing that really gets me about that is men serial killers, well, they can go out there, they can kill 80, 90, 100 women. Nobody does shit about it. But this one poor old welfare lady, she bends the law seven times. And the cops come down on her before she can even get a fucking nickname, you know? <laughs> that ain't right. I got great news for you. This is so good. I have finally figured out men. I'm 37 years old. It's taken me the majority of my life. But yes, I have finally done it, and I can't wait to tell you about it because it's awesome. It's just awesome. Imagine, if you will, nothing at all is men's fault. <laughs> no, 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 it's all our fault. All us women's fault, see? <laughs> because for years we have just been driving ourselves insane by trying to read way too much into what is actually happening in the male mind. You know, you're looking at your old man, you're going, well, goddamn, he can't be this simple. <laughs> no, he's not just sitting here in his underwear, staring at the TV, drinking a beer. No, no, there's something deeper happening here. <laughs> something much, much deeper. Oh, yes, let me think. Oh, I know, this is just the way he relaxes himself. Yeah, so that he can go on and solve the world's problems. I mean, he's planning both of our futures together. He's asking me for another beer, but what he's really saying is that he thirsts for more out of life for both of us. He keeps on changing that channel, uh-huh. Yeah, well, that's just a sign of his restless, untamed sexuality. <laughs> yes, this man sitting here drinking a beer in his underwear, staring at the TV. This man is a complex animal. <laughs> How am I complete without this great intellect? <laughs> then the years go by. <laughs> then one day just hits you up in the face like a ton of dirty socks. You know what I'm talking about? Oh my God, you say. I know what he's doing. I know what he's doing. He is just sitting there in his underpants, drinking a beer and staring at the TV. That big fucking oath. <laughs> Great intellect, he's watching a monster tractor pull over here, for Christ's sake. Oh my God. The problem with us women, I think, is we just got too much shit in our head. Do you know what I mean? There's just too much shit in our heads. Shit that isn't even true, but we still believe it. How come we do that? Even when it's not true, we have no proof that it's true. We still believe it. Do you know what I mean? Like, how come I'm always thinking like this? Okay, you know, I'm just no good at math. God, I can't balance a checkbook. I'm no good with numbers. Not at all, not at all. But then I notice, hey, when I go shopping, I turn into a math wizard. Okay, let's see, that dress is $42 and it's a third off. A third off, 42, that's $14. 14, 42, that's $28 and a six and a half percent sales tax. God, I wish I would've bought this dress in Minnesota. They don't have no sales tax on clothes over there. Anyway, six and a half percent of 28, that's $1.72, so the total price of this dress is $29.72. All right, mm-hmm. <laughs> so let me get out my checkbook now. Okay, there's $4 in there. Four dollars take away twenty nine seventy two. <laughs> ah, fuck it, I'll just write it anyway. <laughs> Cause I mean, you may think you're bad at numbers, man, but when it comes to knowing how fast it's gonna take a check to clear, now you're an international banker. Okay, let's see, it's gonna take three days for this check to clear, so that's a float of two days, and these pants were made in Japan where the yen is doing poorly against the dollar, so by the time I actually have to pay for these pants, well, with that 30% discount and everything, well, they're not gonna cost me over what? 12, 13, $14 tops. All right, all right, what else can I buy? <laughs> the older I get, too, I have to say this, the older you get, the more compassion you get for the opposite sex, you know what I mean? Oh, maybe they drove you crazy before, but now I find myself mellowing. They don't bother me so bad. Even the moron guys. Even the worst of the moron guys, the guys that don't know they're morons, you know what I mean? They don't bother me so much. You know those guys, tobacco juice in the beard, the great big beer gut, and they always have that t-shirt, mustache rides free. 
You know what I'm talking about? You know, as if some woman's gonna look over there, you disgusting ogre. Wait a minute. Mustache rides, and they're free? Well, I had you pegged all wrong. I thought you were a pig, but now I see you're just a generous sexual adventurer. Mount me, mustache man. But I don't know, it's hard being a woman. I don't know, it's hard being a woman. Women are not uh, saints, you know. This is news to me too, I just figured it out. We're big jerks too. What do you think of that? Yeah. Don't you think women are great big old jerks? Yeah, I'll tell you the women that really pissed me off the worst are these emotionally healthy friends that we all have, do you know what I mean, that read all the books. Women, women who love too much, women who weigh too much, women who hate women, women who hate men, and love women, and whatever. Those women that are like the relationship experts. You know those women, the ones that are never with any man. You know those women. <laughs> those really, really bitter women that you have to kind of watch out for because they're just waiting to jump on your shit. You can say the wrong thing, they're down your throat. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you know, you girls, it was really nice seeing you, but I gotta get going because this is the second night in a row that, you know, Tom let me stay out late. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, he let you stay out late, huh? All right. He let you stay out late. God, Rosanne, do you really believe that in your head? I mean, this is the 1990s. Do you really believe in your head? That he... Let you stay out late. No, no, no. I don't mean that. I mean, I mean, uh, he supported me to stay out late. Yeah, that's what I mean. He supported me to stay out late. And lesbians piss me off, too. I mean, generally they're nice people, they piss me off, you know? They're never gonna give you any approval if you're just with a guy. I mean, they give it begrudgingly. Well, if you love him and you think he loves you. I had a dog once, I guess I could understand it. <laughs> then they introduce you to their lover who's standing there wearing a mustache rides t-shirt, you know. <laughs> I'd like you to meet my lover. It's Evelyn Will Daughter. It used to be Will Son, but she changed it to Will Daughter. She's a lumberjill. Everybody knows who lesbians are except for like their own mothers who are living in some peculiar sort of denial, you know, real peculiar. Have you seen Evelyn? Oh, she's still driving that school bus, wears the flannel shirts, the hiking boots. She's such an outdoorsy gal. She has that buzz cut, never wears no makeup. She's just a natural beauty. You know, she was recently elected president of the K.D. Lang fan club. I don't know why she's still single. Some of us know it's true, but anyway. And then women are mean to other women. Like I didn't like that one, Mrs. Bush, uh, when the Wellesley women didn't want old Mrs. Bush coming to talk to him. You know, that really pissed me off. Like, you know, cause they says that she's only there cause of her husband and all this type of shit. That really pisses me off. And young women piss me off anymore, you know, because they really think that they're gonna get out there in the world, get a fair shake, get a lot of money, get a lot of success. Wake up and smell the fucking toast. It really pisses me off, you know? I mean, they're gonna be 60 years old with gray hair and their eyes are gonna be bugging out too and they're gonna be praying their husband was the president of anything. <laughs> Fucking Taco Bell, man. That just pissed me off. But maybe us women, maybe we just want too much, you know? Maybe it's not possible for us to have all the things that we thought we wanted, you know what I mean? Because what do you want? Love, peace, art, beauty, culture, money, children, family, you know, fuck. Look at the men, they only want one thing. You heard that all your life, men only want one thing. I think it's true too, I think that's why they're pissed off at us women cause that one thing ain't even in our top 10 and we still like it better than they do. So. Yeah, but can you imagine the meeting that all the men got together and had in order to decide what that one thing they want out of life was going to be? All right, listen, fellas, I call this meeting to order. Can I have your attention? Shut up. Can I have your attention over here and over here? All right. All right, I got two votes over here for power tools. Uh, the chair recognizes Hiram. 
Well, what if the one thing we wanted out of life was to nurture the life force in every living thing? Yeah, uh, the chair says Hiram is a fag and doesn't deserve to have a penis. <laughs> the chair recognizes Tony. guys, but what if, uh, you know, the one thing we want in life is pussy? <laughs> well, the chair likes pussy. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. aye. So what do you say, guys? We all get out of here, we go try to find some pussy, and uh, if we can't find any, we'll just all come back here and beat the shit out of Hiram. <laughs> you know that meeting. But it's hard to be in a woman, I don't care. That's what I think, because I am one. It's harder for us than it is for you men anyways. Because maybe it'd be easier for us if we were only one woman, but no, we have to have that 28-day cycle, and during that 28 days, at least that many personalities come and inhabit your body, and you're helpless. <laughs> You can't do shit about it, neither. It always starts out with this woman. Well, I want everybody dead. <laughs> then right after her, misses, I just need to clean up around here a little bit. <laughs> You're in there dusting, mopping, vacuuming, folding, nesting. You're having a relationship with your laundry because for some reason that you don't really know about, it is very, very imperative that you get those towels to hang just right, perfect, and symmetrical on that towel rack. It is very, very important. Okay, I'm gonna take this bath towel, I'm gonna fold it in twice, I'll fold it over this way, long ways, and stick it. No, 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 it's too thick when I do that. All I do it once and hang it down like that. Then I'm gonna take the face towel, fold it in two times, like, because I want it to go about two thirds of the way to the bottom of the bath towel. Then I'm gonna take two wash racks, okay, one I'm gonna put like in a triangle shape on top of them two towels. And then the other one I'll fold in three times, like in a rectangle shape, and have it over the side here. Then I'll sort of mush them all together. Yes! Yes! Oh, that looks so good. That's it. That's right. It's perfect. Mm hmm I did a hell of a job there. Uh-huh. You can stay the fuck away from these clean towels! <laughs> then right after that, you get that woman that needs to take control of her life. God, I gotta write more letters, I gotta spend more time with the kids, I gotta spend more time with myself. But first, I gotta go get in shape. Oh yeah, I'm gonna join the gym and I'm gonna wake up at five o'clock every morning. I'm gonna start working out and I'm gonna stop eating red meat. Right after that, Mrs. Oh God, oh God, I am just exhausted. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, I can't even move, I'm so tired. I really should get up and make the kids dinner at seven o'clock. Ah, oh, fuck them, they can just have yogurt. <laughs> then right after that, you get that woman who is in awe of the human race. You know that woman? <sighs> the woman who sits there in front of the TV and her eyes well up with tears because when someone wins on Jeopardy, well, that's just too awesome. <laughs> what a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties. And form and moving, how express and admirable. Just to store all that information and win on Jeopardy. I mean, and Jeopardy is like no easy goddamn game show. <laughs> what a beautiful suit, Alex. <laughs> then right after that, you get like one of your favorite women, your favorite one, the harlot woman, the great big old slut. <laughs> She's favorite, huh? She's like, I just wanna be and get I wanted one time in the morning just to open my eyes. <laughs> then I wanted one time at night just to close them. 
Then I want it one more time during the day just because I know he don't want to. <laughs> And then, I want chocolate. <laughs> then after that, you get the victim woman. Oh God, how can they do this to me? How can they do this to me? I really do not deserve to be treated like this. It's in pure, totally in pure. I don't deserve, I deserve better than this. I've let him go too far this time. <laughs> They've left me here all alone with no Diet Pepsi. <laughs> the victim, the brain's got to be really, really busy, you know, taking all the facts and mushing them all around, switching them all around so that it seems like no matter what happened, you're getting screwed over because those are the rules, sister. You are getting screwed over no matter what. You get this really good idea. You know, I think he'd really like it if I made dinner for him tonight. Uh-huh. I think he'd really, really like that. He'd come home, be all set up, his favorite dinner. Oh, he'd love that. Then we wouldn't have to go out nowhere. We wouldn't have to dress up. We wouldn't have to spend no money. I think he'd really, really love that. And I know it would please him, and I want to please him, because I love him. <laughs> of course. I hope he doesn't start thinking that, you know, he never has to take me anywhere, spend any kind of money on me whatsoever. I mean. Now he comes home two minutes later. He has no fucking idea whatsoever what went on in there all day. But it's too late. It's just too late because it's already up there in your head. It's too late. He walks to the door. Hi, honey, I'm home. Oh, hi, you cheap bastard. You treat me like shit and I'm sick of it. And then it's back. I want everybody. <laughs> and then, of course, we're ready for day two. And oh, you guys are a very good crowd. I had very fun with you. And I wasn't going to do this because I hardly ever do this. You know, I seldom, seldom do this. But you're just such a good audience, you know, that I'm going to do it for you. You know, I seldom do it unless it's the end of my act. But now I'm doing it especially for you tonight. Now, okay, I do it every goddamn minute. All right. Okay, I'm going to say something about our senior hall. I have nothing but respect for the man I want to say first. Nothing but respect. I, I wish him the best. He's, you know, I don't have nothing personal against him or nothing like that. He's very talented. Um, but, well, it just seems like every time I turn on that shitty fucking suck ass show of his, <laughs> there he is again telling another Roseanne Bar fat joke, and it just pisses me off. is the thing. I mean, you know, they're not even funny is the deal. I mean, how hard is that anyway to write a fat joke about me? What does he do? Call all his writers and say, listen, guys, I want you to go out there on a limb. I want you to strike new territory. Stay fresh, stay hip, stay young, stay 90s, and come back to me, guys, get this, with a fat joke about Roseanne Barr. <laughs> a fat joke about Roseanne Barr? Well, they'll never buy it in middle America. A fat joke about Roseanne Barr? I don't know, Arsenio. No, trust me. Trust me. It will work very well if it's really offensive and I do it every goddamn night. <laughs> well, I guess you would know, Arsenio. After all, you are a genius. Woof, woof, woof. <laughs> but he does have some good stuff about him, I have to say. Like, okay, one thing is, well, it's not that often that we get to see a black nerd on TV. <laughs> you know, I mean, most nerds are white people like you. Anyway, okay, I'll tell you the rest. Okay, I'll tell you the whole rest. Okay, okay, I'll tell you. Okay, one time I just, I just, okay, one time I just got so sick of it, you know, okay, so I got in my car and I went over there to his um, studio, Paramount Studios, where he does that show of his, and then I got in my car, went right up to him, and I go, um, excuse me, arse, uh, I says, 
Um, I go, listen, you know, I'm 37 years old, okay? I got four kids. Uh, I'm Jewish and I was raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. I was raised a Mormon and my dad sold crucifixes door to door to Mexicans. <laughs> when I was seven, I fell down, bit off my whole lip, head out of that sewed back on. When I was 16, got hit by a car, got my head impaled on the hood ornament, my legs dropped 30 feet. Got pregnant the first time I ever had sex. My parents made me give the kid up for adoption. I found her 18 years later after her face was splashed across the front page of the National Enquirer. Spent eight months in a state institution, a mental institution, hitchhiked cross country three times all by myself with hepatitis. Lived in a car, a cabin, and a cave. Married a guy just because he had a fucking bathtub. Had three more kids. He treated me like shit every day for 16 years. And when I finally got the guts to dump that son of a bitch, I have to pay him half the money I make for the rest of my goddamn life, Arsenio. Fuck with me! <laughs> Triangle-headed Eddie Murphy kiss-ass motherfucker.